Good. So thank you for uh, joining the talk. Um, really a, lo a lot of people here, that's, that's good. So it seems that big data and is becoming more and more a popular topic. Um, just for curiosity, uh, that I get an idea of what the background is. Who of you, please raise your hand, have some experience with Hadoop already? Okay, quite a lot. Who are working with Spark? Okay, come on. Okay. <laughs> Apache Flink? Okay, some people. Uh, good, um, that's, that's good. Uh, basically, uh, what I try to do today is I give you a general o overview on big data processing engines. So there might be some people who are already working very hard with, with Spark or Flink, so they might, this, but this might be still a uh, repetition. For those of you who have no idea what it is, I'll try also to, to get a little bit basics for why do we need big data processing, uh, what the advantage of it. Uh, I try to focus more on the technology topics, but of course we can talk about real-time applications and business cases as well. So first of all, I would like to introduce me. Um, uh, my name is Stefan Papp. I'm working for a, a company called Unbelievable Machine Company. We are at the uh, Museum Squadier. And basically what we try to do is to, to gain here a lot of projects in the big data market. Austria with big data, it's a topic that is a little bit painful at some point because what we face here in Austria is that um, a lot of uh, this conservatism, you talk with customers and first thing you hear, oh, big data, no, we don't need that, that's new. Uh, so very often our projects are in Germany with, the, with uh, the where the bigger companies are and there we then find also the whole applications what I'm we'll talking, uh, or we'll be talking about today. Uh, so basically Hadoop, I'm doing this since uh, 2011. I'm also teaching big data at, uh, at Fachhochschule Technikum. And uh, I'm also a Hortonworks trainer and uh, book author. So I really try to focus on big data. So this is like where I try to be good at and uh, where uh, also like my passion is. So basically with a software engineering background, uh, I will bring a lot of content based on a um, uh, view of a software developer, software engineer. But uh, as I have been in many projects, I also understand a little bit the data science uh, perspective on technologies or the, the operations or business uh, perspective. So I hope to, to give you all the, 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 the information you need to have to get something with, with you at home for about big data. So what we'll be talking about, so basically, uh, I would like to start uh, by explaining a little bit why we need big data processing, uh, because we could take uh, anything, so why, what is the, the root cause, what is the pain points, what have been, so that you get a bit, little bit understanding where, what are the challenging to set up a uh, big data processing engine. And then uh, in the next step, of course, uh, I would like to do uh, give you a little bit overview after, after we know uh, what uh, makes a good big data processing engine. I would like to talk about two frameworks. One is Apache Spark and then uh, one is Apache Flink. And uh, basically, I will try to explain the concept we have behind it, what, what's important to know, what, what, what is all the, the patterns they are using differences between batch and streaming, for instance, uh, how did they, they these this, this frameworks uh, try to achieve the goals. And then, of course, I would like to, to give you an overview of what to do if you want to start a Flink project or a, a, a Spark project, and what are the pain points, what are the challenges, and what you can achieve with it. And of course, I would like to compare these both technologies. So some people of you, uh, or, uh, basically not some, uh, but rather a lot, or the majority, uh, knows what the Hadoop stack is. But for those uh, who are freshly to Hadoop, I would like to, to uh, go explain a little bit. So we are here. So basically Hadoop is a distributed uh, processing platform that has been created to, to, to meet all the challenges in, in a, w when we're talking about big data applications. When we talk about big data, I don't want to go with the, all this 
uh, typical business stuff with this four Vs or so. But here, I think for, for us, important to know is when we're talking about big data, we're talking really about data that, that you can't normally process anymore on a single machine. So like terabytes of data, petabytes of data. So I've been working with some customers who really like have the, the problem that they collecting with their sensors like uh, petabytes of data and they, they want to know how they can get some value out of it. And basically with Hadoop, the, the, the basic idea is that you have a distributed file system where you can uh, access the data and then you have on top uh, several uh, 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 disk operating system or resource management system to, to access the, the, the data on the, the file system. And here this is like the, the main uh, challenge, like what kind of processing engines you can use to access the data, to program your application that use um, engines and on top of it of course you want to analyze the data you have that the, 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 the machine learning algorithms the, the uh, applications the um, SQL applications and the applications that use make use of the, the data so basically when we talk about big data um, um, we most of it's to understand what the challenges is are it's always important to understand where we are coming from so what is the, uh, and when we talk about the big data use case, uh, there is one, the first real big data use case basically was of search engines. Search engines, in a way, Google was the first one that really had the problem that by collecting the data of various web pages, getting the, them in their the data centers, they very easily, uh, very fast realized that it's not possible to access process all this data with single uh, core machines. Basically, the, the, the data is growing more, fa more fa uh, uh, the, the amount of data was growing faster and faster and the, 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 the hardware they had were not able to, they were not able to um, meet up with the, 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 the data growth. So basically, the, the Google was then the first who approached uh, this, this topic by providing some ideas, papers, uh, to solve this problem with the MapReduce pattern. And MapReduce was then the, the idea that when you had like a typical system in a, in a in this, in this kind of environment, just imagine a huge amount of, of pools where you gather data from web pages, that basically there is no real uh, connection between this, this data pool. So you have, of course, you have these web pages linked to each other if you imagine all these 90 uh, web pages from the 90s and the, the early millennium years, but basically you have huge pools that you just have to go through. You, you process the data, you create some kind of statistics, you have to, you get some data to fill in your uh, page algorithm, and, and basically that's it. So you basically, the, the, the key goal is that if you have uh, 500 gigabytes of data, and if you calculate it in that you then that you do it in one uh, machine, it takes one hour. And if you then think about uh, some systems that distribute this on, on various machines, uh, it's, it's, it's again, uh, you, can do, you can do the math. And basically, this was the, the root cause and this, uh, the, the root system for the big data uh, use cases. Uh, but the point was that basically since the, the Millennium years, the early millennium years, when, when Google came up with this, this concept of map reduce where you scale out, a lot of things have changed. Basically, um, I just want to go ahead. Yeah? Um, but before to that, so basically the change was uh, that, that basically the, the key requirements could worsen and, and more and more requirements were that, that you have to, that there were problems with this MapReduce algorithm because basically there were requirements where, the, where you needed to, to access data, where you have the, the complex machine learning algorithms, where suddenly the shared nothing alg uh, algorithm that was provided by MapReduce is not enough anymore. You have then suddenly, uh, well, MapReduce was very bad with joints, for instance, with SQL on top of, of uh, MapReduce. And so MapReduce was slow. So they had to, to look for an alternative to that. 
But before we go to that, I would like to explain uh, why, uh, in general, uh, we need a data processing engine. Because basically, as we know, I mean, many of you, if you are programmers, so basically it would be pretty easy to, to, to uh, program this um, with a, uh, like a similar like a uh, SOA technology, service-oriented applications. And this is like, uh, this is one of the, I have this from a, a slide deck from uh, Martin Odeski, the inventor of Scala. And basically the point is always when you have this, this, this mo uh, when you don't have this kind of data flow processing engines like MapReduce or some kind of uh, framework that facilitates, you will always have the, the, the point that if you, cal if you uh, process data and you have some uh, asynchronous call to some kind of remote service, uh, what happens, you have always to deal with the concurrency issues that, that many, of our many of you know when they program code. So what happens if here the, the return of this function call gets delayed? Or what ha and this can get really nasty when it's just about, when you have always to make sure that the timing is correct, that uh, you have to deal with hardware failures, and then of course you have to have replacement service so I have been working with a lot of uh, applications and service-oriented uh, frameworks, but this had been really a pain point where you had to really ensure that all the servers are running. So you want to have something that, that uh, is, is fault tolerant. Uh, then we also know that uh, hardware is uh, still in, um, so that we, are, we have to, to embrace that, that there will be hardware failures. And you don't want to have a system where you have to always calculate that if some some node is, is, is going down, that you are basically running into problems. So this is the way what helps us. What is the, the base, what we need? We need a data flow engine. We need some kind of mechanism uh, that will solve our problem. And that was in the beginning the, 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 the uh, MapReduce uh, framework that uh, was brought us to Google uh, from Google uh, in 2003 and this solved basically the concurrent pro concurrency problems and defo uh, default recovery because basically the idea was you program your application uh, your, uh, and basically uh, the, the whole load get distributed and you can scale out as, as, as long as you want. But map reduce had one I big issue so when you map reduce was always uh, did it in a, in a two process uh, step. So basically, when you imagine that you collect the data and you map the data to, to some, uh, with, a, with a map algorithm as it is displayed here, in this, the, 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 the temporary results are always persisted on a, on a hard drive. And so this uh, created some problems that we need, uh, were needed to be solved. Uh, here it's more just uh, uh, explained in detail. Basically, you read values from your uh, in parallel then you persist the data again, then you read again, persist, and so this, and as we all know, IO access is slow, and we, we have to find uh, some ways to, to become better, to, to avoid uh, access to, to IO. So basically the conclusion is, um, yeah, we are in the Stone Age with MapReduce, and now we come to the main point after this uh, introduction, so, we, so the key, key interest is now to find out uh, what can we do to, to improve the performance of MapReduce and all these this, um, processing engines that help us to, to, to process data in a di distributed environment. And we will be talking about two uh, engines. We will talk about Apache Spark and Apache Flink. And they uh, seem to be on a high level view very similar. So like if you see uh, Apache Flink code and the Apache Spark code, you see a lot of similarities on a, on, a, on a high level view because these are both engines that can be programmed with Scala, with uh, Java, with uh, Python. Well, there is no R support in, in, in Flink yet, but I'm sure this will be coming at some point. But under the hood, there are a lot of differences and this difference will be the, the interesting part. Uh, before we go into that, um, about something about general about processing. When we think about processing, 
and we think about um, we want to uh, collect the data in, and then there are two different approaches. The first approach uh, when we think about batch processing is always like we collect the data when we take back when we think back on our uh, on our first root cause uh, root case with uh, search, en search engines. We have a lot of data pools that collected somewhere on on, uh, on servers, and at some point uh, we we trigger some processes where we collect the data from these servers, put them in a batch processor, and we we evaluate the uh, calculate uh, use the data make some processing, we, we run the algorithms on it, we find out the keywords to be displayed on, on a Google search, so we, we, we put them in, in some kind of key value pair so, so that we can, when somebody, a, a consumer accesses the data, can um, access a, a, a Google search, he can get some results. So this is basically the, the, the processing with batch, and when we do some batch processing, the, the key, what we have always to, to think is we have latency. Batch processing, this is the standard way that normally the, the classical um, big data systems are built up. Also Hadoop is very much built up with the batch processing in mind. The idea is always I have to have some kind of um, latency to, to fetch the data from the sources. And um <coughs> the, the main Challenge is to write the when you write the uh, the applications that you connect to the source systems so that the main the main uh, workload is is basically somewhere here on the system that is processing the, the is is the batch processing system. Um, on the other hand, if you think about <laughs> streaming processing, uh, the basically here we have a huge change in terms of uh, responsibility. Stream processing uh, uh, engines always uh, basically you you remove the main um, responsibility from the servers of, of, of for the trigger for the, the processing for the uh, to, to to process the data basically or basically to fetch the data to to to, con to have a control over the workflow you, you you move it a little bit out because basically. That the, the 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 data providers uh, are now responsible to put the push the data to you, and not the, the the processing engine to fetch the data from the, the 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 producer. This makes a huge difference because then you can basically fetch the data when it's created. And and like if you look about the, the typical streaming engine engines, you don't have any latency anymore. And this this is that the, the but on the, on the other hand, you have less throughput. And that's why uh, we created an uh, additional um, system. This is like some kind of uh, architecture patterns where we decided that uh, we can combine the, uh, the streaming, the advantages of a, of a streaming architecture and the batch processing architecture in a, in a so-called Lambda architecture. So a Lambda architecture is like a state-of-the-art uh, processing engine to, to get the advantages of both worlds because one problem is always with this stream processor. Streaming is always very much um, not, not targeted to keep a lot of data uh, in uh, like stored because basically stream processing is always when you have continuously uh, uh, data delivery like you would use a stream processing very much in in uh, in like in, in some cases where data is continuously produced, uh, you have also to find a and then you have at the same time to store your data for for recovery. Then it's a it's a pain point and and so in the basically in the classical lambda architecture, you you have your uh, data produce, uh, producers that stream the data in, but at the same time you have a storage layer that for batch processing where you archive your data, you. Uh, you store your data on a, on a typical uh, big data platform like Hadoop where it gets replicated and so when, when you have a complete fallout, normally the stream processing layer, um, you can lose all the data because it's anyway stored here. So basically you use a 
uh, batch processing, architecture for storing, permanently storing the data, and use a, 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 a stream processing architecture to um, keep your data in memory to for fast access for, for recent data, and then you combine it again in a, in a serving layer where you very often have a key value store to, uh, to, to access both, you, so you that the consumer can as well look up historical data from the batch layer and as well as uh, uh, data from the real uh, speed layer in the cloud architecture. Um, and if you then look at the technologies that are behind it, um, so I don't, uh, I don't want to go too much into the detail of the, the, the measures things using storage layers because this would kill the, the, the scope. What we're talking about today is Apache Spark and Apache Flink. So I will skip that because this, is, this will be explained in any ways. So Apache Spark, um, Apache Spark, so. Apache Spark has, uh, is, a, is a typical patch pro processing framework that was created in 2011 uh, in California by a company called uh, Databricks. And basically the idea of Apache Spark was that th uh, they basically were looking for some use cases for their, they created a Mesos as well. Mesos is a is a is a, is a, uh, a um, something similar like Yarn, a framework to uh, manage resources on on, on 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 distributed systems. And they were thought, hmm, we need actually something similar like MapReduce, but maybe a little bit faster. So what can we do? And out of this, they created a, a, this data processing engine called uh, Spark, where they facilitate the, the whole um, um, processing of big data. What many people get wrong is that um, when people talk about Apache Spark, they say very often, oh, Apache Spark, yes, that's a part of Hadoop or there's a Hadoop framework and so on. What you have to know in advance, you have here a complete framework that you can, you can access every kind of data store that you, that you want to access. So Apache Spark, is connected to the uh, stores via drivers. You have a, a API that connects, so you can use uh, run a budget Spark on Cassandra, on Hadoop, uh, on S Amazon S3, and basically on top of Apache Spark, you can use then your um, APIs for for machine learning, for graph engines, and and so on. So on. And the good thing about Apache Spark, you can uh, program it with Scala, Java, Python, or R, whatever you like to use. So um, now what's the, 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 the key differences to, to MapReduce? Basically, the, the key requirements, as I said, were that, that the, the, the classical shared nothing uh, architecture where MapReduce was actually good at, uh, was uh, basically outdated. So what we needed for machine learning, it was, it got very clear that we need some kind of uh, processing engines where we can be sure that when there is a linkage between the data pools, when we need to, to have to join data sets, that we need to get better. And the other thing, uh, for all of you who uh, were programming MapReduce or where you have seen MapReduce code, the code of with MapReduce was always a, a very large code. It was very complicated because you had to write it a huge amount of Java code where you derive from classes and it, it created a lot of uh, complicated code. So word count, uh, that the simplest uh, um, program that you could write with uh, Java can takes then around uh, 50 lines of code or 100 lines of code whatever, how, how you program it. And the good thing is with the new um, processing engines like Spark, um, you reduce the, the amount of, of code in, uh, immensely. There are two um, very important um, concepts that you have to keep in mind when you wanna program um, Spark or what the key innovation is with Spark. The first is, um, when you 
think about uh, processing the data, you need, uh, the, the, as I tell you, the, the key challenge of um, MapReduce was always with each step you process the data, the data was stored again to the disk. And this uh, part uh, was then uh, removed by here. The, the key idea was if I want to process the data, I want to do something that so that I, I get rid of the, the serialization, which takes a lot of time. And so they, uh, uh, one of the key concepts of Apache Spark was to create distributed containers where you can keep uh, your uh, intermediate results in memory. And with that, uh, you have the, the, the possibility to recreate data whenever you want. And also, you, you don't need to, to store the, the data, the, the, pre the, the, the intermediate results to the disk, and you, you are processing, it gets faster. The next step that made uh, Apache Spark program faster than MapReduce because it was all about speed was uh, when you create some kind of um, process that where you want to process your huge uh, data silos, uh, it's always a good idea to, and if you create a complex pipeline to uh, find ways to uh, optimize uh, the processing and you do that with an optimizer that you create a, a, a complete um, process flow for the, the, the process you plan to do. And an optimizer will reduce, will then uh, op uh, optimize your execution, which ends up in, in far more performant uh, code that will be executed. So, as I said, um, you can run Spark everywhere. And so let's say if you want to uh, start your Spark programming, um, basically you, can, you don't need any big clusters or any, any, anything at all because in the beginning, because if you want to get started, you can you run them local. The good thing is with Spark, it's, it's the, you create, uh, you have, it can run ev it everywhere. So you program your code that you want to then test with big data applications. Let's, let us assume you create an um, application that explores a huge amount of text uh, that you can maybe collect from Twitter or whatever. Because when we think about the big data application, we always think about uh, data that is that is I it produced in, in in masses. And when we uh, and when we think it uh, as an easy use case, processing um, Twitter Twitter tweets and dozens of them or millions of them, then we are there. Or when we when you have some kind of uh, idea to process sensor data, you can c get your sample set uh, and you can run it first locally on your client machine. And basically with Spark, uh, you, have, you, can, you have various ways to execute it. You can create a, a Spark, uh, you, you, you download, it, you download it, the, the executables in, in from um, the, the Spark homepage and you can then create your Sparks. Uh, you have a, a, a shell where you can basically, uh, similar like with Python or any other REPL, try it out, execute it locally, and then uh, test the functionality. And later on, you deploy the whole th system to the servers. Spark has been um, uh, basically used a lot. Uh, it gets more and more uh, uh, execution engine that gets integrated in, in various applications. Who of you all know Zeppelin? Yeah, this is very common that um, basically Spark has, run, has been transitioned from um, um, an application that has been basically built for, for uh, executed with, within a huge service into a very much into, a, in, it gets integrated in, in so-called web notebooks where you explore, where you get peop, give people a lot of access, access to uh, data stores where you have, uh, where you explore data in uh, where you connect basically to the data pools and you have uh, joint access for engineers and scientists so that the, the 
a data engineer can write this code for the, 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 the data aggregation to, to prepare the data for analysis and afterwards uh, with the same application, the same notebook, your, your, your scientists uh, explore the data. Good. Uh, to sum it up, um, you write your code and then um, you, what do you need for this? Uh, basically to, uh, to understand what, a, uh, what you need for a Spark application. Um, you always write the code in a driver program and this, this code uh, in your driver program is, is a basically the application. And then you decide where to execute it uh, and uh, basically you can execute it on your cluster or on your local machine. Good. Um, I just want to uh, expl explain a little bit on, on, the, on, the, on the core of, of, the, of, the, of a Spark program and then I will uh, switch to a, a budget link. Um, basically, what you have to understand is that um, on the heart of uh, a Spark program is always the, this, this, this uh, distributed data set as I was explaining. Uh, in there are two, I would say, two lands of uh, data containers. Uh, one is a data container for uh, resilient, uh, it's called resilient distributed data sets. It's untyped data sets that you, that is uh, still um, uh, basically is using the, 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 the JVM of all the cluster nodes where the data is then stored. And, but basically uh, starting with uh, uh, Apache uh, Spark 1.6, uh, the idea was that um, they wanted to get rid of the, the JVM as JVM was, was pretty slow and they decided to, keep to, to, to create a new um, type data set that can, be, uh, uh, that can uh, give, give ad additional performance uh, improvements by being typed. One uh, key uh, uh, improvement of uh, Apache's Spark 1.6 uh, was the idea to to get rid of the typical <coughs> storage in the JVM. So uh, basically what was the idea? The JVM was never designed to, to, to be run uh, with big data environments and uh, because the garbage collection, when you, the typical thing what you do with big data is you collect a lot of data and then you get rid of a lot of data because you load a lot of data, process it and then you remove the then, then, you, get, then you don't need it anymore, you remove it from the heap. So this, with all the, the typical big data processing platforms, um, the, the, the garbage collector uh, was heavily used. So with um, Spark 1.6, they, they, uh, they re completely rewrote the code, created new containers and, uh, for processing the data. So. Um, I just, so basically if you write a Spark program, as I said, there is the driver program that is the, is, is the hook into your, um, uh, into your uh, cluster. Basically, the, the first thing you need to do is uh, you create this uh, 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 from a, a singleton class that's called uh, Spark context or Spark session, depending on which version you're using. This is like the class that knows everything about uh, about what the environment you're using. You can connect it to a cluster. You can use it, run it locally on your environment, and then you can. Um, the first thing you always do in a Spark program, you create data. For instance, you create you 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 load data from your cluster. This can be then uh, uh, like. Uh, gigabytes of data in a, in a remote cluster or in a, a small uh, file on your local uh, system. The good thing with big data processing engine like Spark is always, uh, it doesn't matter so much. Uh, so, so what they try to, to make, the, the key idea is, uh, it doesn't matter if it, it's, it's big or small, the idea is it always is, is scalable. So basically, 
by being able to, pro to, to scale out, uh, you can run the same application on, on, a, on a local environment, on a small data, as well as on, on in, a, in a big data environment. So once you have that loaded the data, it's in, in, in this, in this uh, RDD, which uh, is then the distributed data set, and this is then distributed over all the nodes, and you can basically run all your transformations on it. Um, then the, op the typical operations on, on Spark is um, you can transform the data, and then basically once the data is transformed, uh, you can uh, then store it again. Um, so basically, uh, this here is uh, a typical example uh, of, 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 of Spark transformation. Here in the, the first example, you load the data, and then you can apply map functions, flat map, <coughs> or you can remove the data. So always keep in mind when we when we're talking about this, we could be talking about uh, paralyzing the, the, the access of on, on gigabytes or terabytes of data. I will go a little bit ahead of this because basically um, I'm running out of time and I want to show you a little bit about the project link as well. So basically when we, um, what we can then do on, right, on, on basically what what do we want to do on, the, on this kind of data? Uh, basically, when we have, so we have now here a way to process terabytes of data, and basically then we have the, the, the applications on top of it. So we have, uh, for instance, uh, one of the key requirements of the community was um, we want to have SQL on top of, of Apache Spark. Uh, there is also, like as I said, Apache uh, Spark is, is basically a, a batch processing framework uh, that is um, uh, that was designed for for this uh, was was never designed for streaming, but they the, the, the core developers of Spark then uh, found a way to em emulate streaming via uh, micro batches, and of course uh, as uh, as one of the key things is to uh, emulate, uh, so to, to uh, allow a machine learning algorithm on Spark and on, and also of course also like graph processing. Um, I think it, it's, it's out of the scope to go into this in detail, so I would like to, to skip over this and just to explain a little bit the difference um, to from Apache Spark to Apache Streaming, uh, to, to Apache Flink. So basically, one of the um, sorry. So the second framework that I would like to, to introduce is um, is Apache Flink. Apache Flink is is the, the main difference from Apache Flink to Apache Spark is that Apache Flink is a streaming uh, platform. That is uh, that is th that's. So th this means that Apache Flink has a different way to process data as, as Apache Spark. So there is always the so the idea is always we're streaming the same continuous processing on, da on, the, on data that is continuously pr uh, produced. <coughs> so you would use, for instance, Apache Spark in, and I know a lot of use cases where Apache, Apache Spark is used when you process really. Uh, uh, so for things like um, basically when data, when you have huge pools of data and this data is, is, is very static, uh, there, there are typical applications in, in um, uh, you have seen use cases in, the me in, in medical applications where you uh, load data for, for graph data for um, um, this, this kind of, uh, this, this, uh, no, how was it called? This gen genomics, yeah? This is a typical <coughs> example. And the typical uh, application for streaming is really when, when you produce uh, data continuously, like uh, I know the, the typical, so there is an application for, for like when you have sensor data, when you, ex uh, uh, in, in industry 4.0, um, Apache Flink is, is heavily used. 
Apache Flink has a very similar uh, ecosystem as uh, Apache Spark. The only difference, as I said, is, is, is that it was designed for, um, for streaming instead of uh, batch, and, and that's the main difference. So basically, whenever you have a, a framework um, that is, uh, when you have data that is continuously pr uh, produced, you will use Apache Flink, and uh, when you have huge pools of data, this is, and you want to have a, um, a, a framework that is is pretty much uh, um, like has a huge user base, then you would uh, use Apache Spark. This would be the main difference. I would say that's important. Well, did you have both? <laughs> like uh, then I would use uh, a Lambda architecture. So basically, um, uh, or can you give me the, uh, the, uh, the example that you're uh, thinking about, a, spe a specific example? So to collect all the open data you can get, you have tons of batch data, you get some streaming data also in there, you want to process it for some visualization on top, yeah. whatever. Um, Basically, you could, in, in theory, of course, also use both frameworks. Uh, but uh, the, the experience shows that um, uh, it, it the question is always on the throughput you have. Uh, Apache Spark is, is um, you have a committer base of 900 people, and with Apache Flink, you have a committer base for around 180. There is tons of material with Apache Spark. So what I realize is that a lot of people, when they where the question is, uh, what shall we use? Um, then uh, the question is always, do we have a use case where we ha where we need to, to have the speed of Apache Flink? Because you will find uh, uh, um, there th a richer ecosystem with Apache Spark. There is a lot of, uh, especially when you look on machine learning applications, so that the machine learning uh, for libraries that are used with Apache Spark are by far more rich than, than Apache Flink, because Apache Flink, the, the, the main focus is really to the speed, so to, to give you a library where you can uh, uh, reach a throughput from, from uh, 50 million uh, mes messages per second, which is huge, which is, uh, a spar I think Spark is around um, 300,000 uh, messages per second. Um, basically, um, yeah, I'm running out of time anyway, so I, th I suggest uh, the only that we uh, now switch to the, the question and answer because basically one thing is that you have to keep in mind is, is basically the way you program these frameworks is very similar. Also with Apache Flink, you have the, the you, you have uh, um, uh, API that is pro you very that you can program with Scala or, or Java or Python. And the idea, the, uh, the basic concepts of programming are ex uh, very similar. The only huge difference is that, uh, so the, the biggest huge is the, uh, uh, difference is the, the ecosystem that I uh, used, the, the quality of the, the, the libraries. So with Apache Flink, you have th these libraries that are really fast and, and it's, it's really uh, 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 designed for performance. And Apache Spark is uh, more or less, um, like really like he has a far more broader use uh, user base. Yeah, basically uh, I would be through because, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, how about Question. that I have is that uh, Flink is, is 15 million messages per second in a, in a benchmark and uh, well, what kind of messages? How large are the messages? Um, there, is a, there is a test described in, on, um, on YouTube uh, sorry on there, there is 
at the Yahoo data, uh, Yahoo data test, uh, and they did where they in detail described the, the, the messages they used. So I don't know if exactly how large they were, but I, I assume, yeah, look it up <coughs> carefully. It's, uh, the, it's Yahoo benchmark test with Flink and you will find it right away. So those, those benchmark data was used for both frameworks? Yeah, so basically the, there was the benchmark done by, by Yahoo actually to compare uh, a part more, fra more stream processing frameworks and their conclusion was mostly that uh, Apache Storm, which is, uh, was the, the fastest one, and this test was then uh, redone with, um, by the data artisans, the creators of Apache Flink, and they uh, adapted the test a little bit where they uh, came to the maximum speed of Apache Flink with 15 messages per second. Yeah. A question? Yes, I, I, have, I have one question, and, and let me pre because I'm, I'm a total amateur what, what yeah. concerning big data. Um, in this Flink approach, um, if you, for example, want to calculate some, some, for example, moving average, where yeah. you have to, um, well, to, uh, to take into account some data that was processed some time before, and, and well, create a, a, a moving average, is there any problem with that? Because, I mean, so somehow you have, to, you have to fetch the data, um, so there would be some latency, right? The, 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 the other data you, you want to add to um, to create a moving average. Is there any problem with that, or, or do I just not, not, not see how that is? Um, basically, with Apache Flink and Apache Spark, you have two ways you can uh, process the data, either, either with streaming or uh, batch. Uh, so basically, the, the main difference is that one framework, Apache Spark, was designed for batch and emulates streaming. And Apache Flink is a streaming platform that emulates a batch processing. So when you process the data, basically uh, you write an application with, uh, with a streaming platform, you write an application that listens to new incoming data. And so basically the, you have your data pr uh, producers that send, by, for instance, via REST data to your Flink program. And, uh, and your Flink is then uh, processing this data. And then you create another, another, another. And, and you, for instance, you have then uh, uh, a system that, uh, that is then constantly <coughs> fed ex externally from data. With a batch processing, you basically, you, 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 you write the application and this application fetches then uh, the, the data from these this, this, this huge data sources. So that's the, um, and you were asking about a moving, a moving average. So I need to, and I'm, I'm adding some, some, some one more data point, and I'm calculating a, a average on the last hundred data points. But the, the 99 before might have come, whatever minutes, seconds, hours uh, before. That's out of order processing what you yeah. describe, and this, uh, and and there are um, systems that are. Uh, able to process it, and uh, and other system are not. So Apache Flink, for instance, is a is a framework that is able to to process uh, out of order processing. So uh, there, if, if if they're not in time, then uh, they would the Apache Flink would realize that they have to reorder the. the okay, so but since this has its yeah. own name, it's it's kind of a it's it's tricky it's apparently. Well, it's uh, if uh, the question is if the framework supports it or not. Uh, there are frameworks who simply don't support it. Of course, as a, a, as a programmer, you have to understand the concept and you have to, to imp implement your solution in a way uh, that uh, when you implement it, that, that, that you enable this feature. So, so basically, yeah. Yeah? One more question. Could be also three. No, this is this is a uh, a very common problem with uh, frameworks because the the fault tolerance um, there is the, the there is the various categories for fault tolerance and 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 and, and 
Apache Flink and, Bo and Apache Spark have at least one uh, uh, broker runs. Yeah, of course. Um, compared to all the other Apache frameworks like Apex, Luffy, whatever there is there, yeah. there's lots more. Um, are there any ones which is like, I think Spark and Fling are the most famous. Is there something yeah. in your opinion which is like also pretty good and also doing a good job? I mean, um, just worth looking into. Yeah, um, worth looking into it are. I mean basically, if you compare with uh, Flink and, 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 and Spark, there are of course some upcoming uh, frameworks. I mean, Apex is, is one of them, uh, but Apex is Hadoop bound, so basically you can't use Apex uh, aside of Hadoop. And uh, 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 the thing that I haven't seen too much use cases for that. So basically, you can of course also explore uh, Twitter here on. I mean, it's, it's, it's pushed by, by Twitter. This could, could evolve pretty fine. But if you really would right now, if it's about deciding which framework to use, uh, it's, 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 I would say there's, a, there's the question, do you need speed? If yes, then, then explore Flink. But if you just did a framework that is, is doing it, it fine, then, then go for Spark because Spark has the best documentation. Uh, it has the best ecosystem that you can get. And um, basically the, the, the support is, is, is amazing. So if you write, you can see it by the, 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 the average answers on, on, on Stack Overflow, for instance, if you, if you have a spa, Spark question, it gets answered pretty fast and, in, and also like in, with Flink, it takes some time. I mean, I've been uh, um, writing a Flink uh, code and, and Spark code and what I realized uh, was that, that there are some basic features that you would expect from a framework that are not there in Flink. For instance, it, it's some time ago. In the meantime, it's 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 already solved, I think. But uh, at some point, I wanted to uh, write a code where that where I read data from H base, uh, not sorry, from H catalog, so from the Hive Meta store. And with Spark, it's pretty clear that you have your Hive con uh, context and you have your connectors to to, to the H catalog and was one year ago and it wasn't there yet at, at Flink. So Flink, you can so you can see really see that this is very targeted on, on, on a lot of use cases where speed is the, is the most important thing. Um, the, the people that I know that are working with Flink are very often work with so, so the, with really uh, extremely tough challenges like in, in, in online gaming. So King is for instance a good example. This is an online gaming platform that is uh, where they, they have some amazing requirements for, for, for their, 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 their processing. Yeah. Yeah. Will the site be available or no? Yeah. Again, where, as we want to promote uh, all the techniques and, yeah. and, and all the knowledge, yes, uh, we will all, all distribute via our homepage, Meetup, Twitter, on all our channels. Yeah. Does it make sense to use both of the frameworks for streaming and dashboard booking? Because um, as I've read in different kinds of magazines, um, one of the advantages of the lambda architecture is to uh, have the same code base for each data streaming yeah. and dashboard booking. So That's true. If I use the both frameworks, I would use that advantage. Basically, you answered your question already. Yes. Uh, this is this is. <laughs> Um, I mean, I have designed uh, once a uh, Lambda architecture with Spark and I was able to reuse a lot of uh, code again from <coughs> from the batch process. Um, yes, basically the code reuse would be the, the, the key point uh, where I would simply use the same technology. I mean, if there is some reason that you have then, I mean, it's, it's, it, there's, it's not forbidden there. The if you have some specific use cases where you have to get an additional speed in, then you can of course use Flink, but I think this will this very rarely will happen. Are there any some Lambda architecture frameworks like similar to, I've never heard of like a Lambda architecture framework. 
no, there are no, no frameworks. Basically, um, designing Lambda archi architectures, uh, it's 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 a very much uh, focused on on what your requirements are, and um, the the whole. Basically, you have to understand uh, Kafka, Apache Kafka framework. You have to understand Apa Apache Spark, and the rest is domain logic, and that's why there are no frameworks. And then you have, of course, decide for a, for a key value store, but that's it. So basically, you use a little bit the technology. And the rest is the domain, domain knowledge. That, that's why I think there will be no framework ever for this. Okay, if there are no further questions, I say thank you. <laughs>